Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're continuing on with the video on Genesis Apologetics channel asking if the story of Adam and Eve is unscientific myth or literal history. When we last left off, they seemed like they were about to get into the whole mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam thing, so let's see if that's where they're actually going and if they mention the fact that Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve probably lived thousands of years apart from each other. From a purely genetic standpoint, is it scientifically feasible that all humans descended from a single mother and a single father? Not if you consider the mother and father to have been a single couple, no. But all humans do share a last common ancestor that was male and a last common ancestor that was female. Many insist this is absurd, and yet the genetic evidence for a literal Adam and Eve is inside each one of us. You have to define literal quite loosely to get there, but sure? In 1987, a milestone paper was published in the journal Nature by leading evolutionary geneticists who announced the results of a mitochondrial DNA analysis. Geneticists from the University of California found that all humans are descended from one woman thought to have lived in Africa 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Correct. Now, do you see the problem with that from a young Earth creationist standpoint? There's more than one, but the main problem is sitting there glaring you right in the face, being highlighted in your own video. You know, that whole lived about 200,000 years ago line? More subtle is, once again, the fact that this paper reaches its conclusions by assuming that evolution happens. If evolution does not happen, then the conclusions of this paper are wrong, plain and simple. It's like you're pointing at the roof of a house and saying, see, because that roof is there, the foundation of the house must have been destroyed. Nope, if the foundation is gone, the roof falls down. If the roof is still up, then the foundation must be okay. Their results sent shockwaves throughout the scientific community. Yes, they did, but not for the reasons that you're implying. You see, these results supported the idea that the last common ancestor for humans was not only fairly recent, but was located in Africa, an idea that was somewhat controversial at the time. But it's actually rather unfortunate that the moniker Mitochondrial Eve caught on so well, because Mitochondrial Eve was not the first ever human woman, there were others before her. And who mitochondrial Eve was actually changes over time. As mitochondrial lineages go extinct, which they do do on occasion, the last mitochondrial common ancestor moves forward in time. So who mitochondrial Eve was is not a constant. And the same goes for Y chromosome Adam when we get to him. And called for a major rewrite of the evolutionary view of human origins to accommodate the new data. Because that's what happens in science. When we learn new things, we adjust our picture of the world to accommodate the new things, instead of just plugging our ears and going, la 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 la, we can't hear you. Not listening. Not listening. The revision gave rise to the now widely accepted out of Africa theory. Proponents of the theory couldn't help but notice its uncanny resemblance to the biblical Eve. I wouldn't say it was an uncanny resemblance. I would say rather that because the biblical Adam and Eve story is so well known in our culture, it was just an easy comparison to make. But as has been pointed out numerous times, including in the article that you yourself are showing, the analogy is only superficial. As soon as you get into the details, the differences massively overpower the similarities. According to the evolutionary perspective, mitochondrial Eve was an woman who evolved out of Africa from a Homo erectus population of ape men. I don't know where you got that from. I can't find it in any of your sources. Mitochondrial Eve would have lived in a human population. In fact, we don't even know if we are directly descended from Homo erectus. It's certainly within the realm of possibility, and they were still alive when Mitochondrial Eve would have lived, but I can't even find anything suggesting that she evolved out of a Homo erectus population. And this is exactly why it's unfortunate that this name caught on. It tends to mislead people. We are familiar with the Bible story of Adam and Eve. They were the first two people. So when we hear that scientists have discovered Mitochondrial Eve, we make the connection and think that she must have been the first human woman, which is not even close to being accurate. Not long after the first mitochondrial DNA studies revealed a single mother of us all, evolutionary geneticists found similar results when analyzing sequences on the male Y chromosome. 
Okay, again, you sound like you're trying to make this out as though scientists were surprised or shocked by these discoveries. In this case, it was more of a, hey, if the mitochondrial DNA that we get only from our mother in most cases can tell us approximately when the last mitochondrial common ancestor to all humans lived, maybe the same could be true of the Y chromosome, which we get only from our father in most cases. Nobody was shocked by the fact that these last common ancestors existed. It's merely a question of when and where they existed. And yes, the initial when and where was a bit surprising, but that is entirely irrelevant to the point that you are trying to make here. In 1997, a team of researchers from Stanford University reported to the American Society of Human Genetics that all men inherited their Y chromosome from a single male ancestor. Not really. What they actually reported was that, after examining the YALU insertional polymorphism, or YAP, which I'm just going to call YAP because I like the sound of that, if, I don't know if you're actually supposed to call it YAP or if you're supposed to say YAP, but it's YAP to me. So after examining the YAP element of over 1,500 people from all around the world, they found that there were five main haplotypes of this YAP element that could be found throughout the world, all of which could be traced back to African ancestry. To quote the paper, the global analysis of Y chromosome haplotypes shows that paternally inherited variation outside of Africa is a subset of the variation existing within Africa. The bit about the last common Y chromosome ancestor was a single paragraph where they didn't actually do the work themselves, but were citing an earlier 1995 study that performed that calculation and found that the Y chromosome ancestor likely lived about 188,000 years ago, with a 95% confidence interval from 51,000 to 400. 111,000 years. If you're unfamiliar with confidence intervals, it's a statistical calculation that essentially gives a range. In this case, there's a 95% chance that the Y chromosome atom lived between 51,000 and 411,000 years ago, with 188,000 years ago being what they think is the most likely point. This is an important distinction, because what we're finding is that all of the genetic data shows that humanity originated in Africa. But according to the biblical account, humanity originated somewhere in the vicinity of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which are in modern-day Iraq. Certainly, Iraq is close to Africa, but close only counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and flatulence. What I mean is, the Bible has the origin of humanity wrong by at least 2,500 kilometers, or roughly the distance from New York to Colorado. The sequencing of thousands of Y chromosomes from diverse people groups living around the world has revealed an overall lack of Y chromosome diversity. All men share the same Y chromosome. No, no, that's not what that means. Lack of diversity does not mean we all have the same one. It's that they aren't as different as they could be, and in every case they could construct phylogenies that trace them back to haplotypes that could be found in Africa, specifically sub-Saharan Africa. And these findings actually matched up with the evolutionary picture of several migration events out of Africa, leading to the population of the various parts of the world. Think of it like this. A toy company designs a toy spaceship. They could choose to color that ship in any color they want. There are literally millions of colors to choose from. But they decide to produce it in blue, green, and yellow. Three colors out of millions. That's certainly not very diverse. But not being diverse does not mean that everyone who bought it all got the same color. Plus a small number of mutations consistent with a single male ancestor of the human race. And as with mitochondrial Eve, the Y chromosome atom will move forward in time as different Y chromosome lineages eventually go extinct. Who the mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome atom are today are not necessarily who they always have been, and they definitely won't stay consistent through the rest of human history. And in a moment we'll actually touch on the discovery of a previously unknown Yap haplotype in modern humans, which had the effect of pushing the Y chromosome atom further back in time. But I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll get to that when we get to that. Once again, evolutionary geneticists couldn't help but give the father of us all a biblical name, Y chromosome Adam. I mean, mitochondrial Eve had already caught on by that point, so it's not really surprising that the next logical step in the bad analogy would be taken. But hey, while I have it paused here, how about we look at the study title? Why chromosome shows that Adam was an African? Why is it that all of our research demonstrates that humans originated in Africa if the biblical account is actually correct and we originated in Mesopotamia? 
Like, in order for the Bible to be correct here, then after the Tower of Babel, God would have had to have magically transported all of the people from Mesopotamia to Sub-Saharan Africa, and then have them spread out less magically from there. And he would have had to do this more than a hundred thousand years ago. Just as they did with mitochondrial Eve, evolutionists interpret Y-chromosome Adam to be an evolved ape-man from Africa that lived sometime around 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Only in the sense that all modern humans are evolved ape people. This Y-chromosome Adam was not the first human male. If we go to the old end of the confidence interval, he existed some 411,000 years ago, which is about 139,000 years later than the latest end of the estimate for when modern Homo sapiens first evolved. Worst case scenario here, humanity as we know it had already existed for an order of magnitude longer than recorded human history when Y chromosome Adam was born. The evolutionary community acknowledges that there is a literal Y chromosome Adam and there is a literal mitochondrial Eve. And that they were not the first two humans, nor did they necessarily mate with one another, nor did they necessarily even live at the same time as one another. So they are only literally Adam and Eve, in that all of humanity share them as their mitochondrial and Y chromosome ancestor. And if evolution is true, then their existence is pretty much guaranteed. They say it's clear that all of the Y chromosomes on this planet trace back to a single individual who didn't live so long ago. 188,000 years ago isn't so long ago on the grand scale of things, but young Earth creationists want the entire universe to be between 6 and 10,000 years old, so he existed more than 100,000 years before the rest of the universe in your worldview. He also lived in the wrong region of the planet. The Y chromosomes only passed on through the male, right? Father to son. Well, the mitochondrial chromosome is only transmitted through the female. And that chromosome, also, all the genesis agree, all people on the planet get their mitochondria from a woman who lived not so long ago. Again, not so long ago is, in the case of our mitochondrial common ancestor, almost 200,000 years before the universe began in the young Earth creation model, and again is in the wrong region of the Earth. This whole argument breaks down to some people made a bad analogy, therefore the story that they were analogizing to must be a true story, because literally none of the data actually fit that story. And it's uncontested. Yes, the fact that if you go back far enough, all of humanity has a common ancestor is uncontested, because that's exactly what we would expect if evolution were true. And it turns out initially, uh, the evolutionists said, yeah, but it looks from our estimates of how long ago those individuals lived, that they didn't live in the same time span. Their error bars overlap, so it's hypothetically possible, but it is much more likely that they did not. Now, actually, that they've, done, that they've reworked their numbers, they're always reassessing the time scales. Uh, they're Adam and Eve, the mitochondrial Eve and the Y chromosome Adam. They are in the same time span. Okay, so I've been working from the studies that these guys have been citing, which are rather old, being from the 80s and 90s. When looking at more recent estimates, in 2015, researchers discovered a new Y chromosome haplogroup, which had the result of pushing the Y chromosome common ancestor back to a range of about two to 300,000 years ago, while a 2013 analysis put the mitochondrial common ancestor at a range of 99 to 148,000 years ago. Also worth mentioning is that we have access to the Neanderthal genome, and by performing a similar analysis, we've been able to put our Y chromosome common ancestor for all of humans and Neanderthals as having lived about 588,000 years ago. This find has been dubbed the anti-Adam, or the Adam that came before Adam. So if you're accepting the science that concludes that all humans have a Y chromosome common ancestor, then you needs must also accept the science that all humans have a Y chromosome common ancestor that they shared with Neanderthals, which came before the human Y chromosome Adam. There are two fundamental differences between the Adam and Eve of the Bible and the evolutionary interpretation of mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. At least two, yes. And in order to get around these differences, the creationists have to ignore huge chunks of the research that gave them the answers that they were kinda looking for. 
These conclusions about our Y chromosome and mitochondrial common ancestors are the direct result of certain evolutionary assumptions, and if they can be trusted to come to the conclusion that all humans share both a mitochondrial and Y chromosome common ancestor, then you need to be able to trust the evolutionary assumptions that got them there. Also keep in mind that when saying assumption here, I'm not talking about them just assuming without evidence that evolution is true. I'm using the word assumption in the sense that the papers talking about our mitochondrial and Y chromosome common ancestors did not themselves provide the evidence for their assumptions, instead relying on the work of previous researchers who have provided that evidence. Lest someone be tempted to make a clip of me talking about how modern evolutionary researchers rely on assumptions instead of evidence. Which, you know, if it's going to happen, it'll happen despite my explaining this, because context isn't exactly something that creationists are known for caring about. The first difference has to do with time, and the second has to do with population size. Oh wow, I didn't even get into the population size thing. I thought for sure it was going to be location, you know, because of that whole they lived in Africa, not Mesopotamia thing. The Genesis account indicates Adam and Eve lived recently, just thousands of years ago. No, the Genesis account says no such thing. That is a number that's arrived at by tracing biblical genealogies which have people living to be several hundred years old. So by adding up numbers in a clearly mythological genealogy, they arrive at about 6,000 years old. But nowhere in Genesis does it actually give any date for this or anything. As such, this is a matter that is up for interpretation and that they were the only two people alive at the time of their creation. Again, it doesn't explicitly state that, but it is somewhat implied. However, I would argue that the existence of cities that Cain was afraid to go to after killing Abel suggests that there were other people that God was supposed to have created aside from Adam and Eve, and there are Jewish traditions that certainly mention other people aside from Adam and Eve, most notably Lilith, Adam's first wife who was expelled from the garden for not being submissive enough. But yeah, if we're sticking to an overly simplistic interpretation of one single ancient Hebrew story, well, rather, at least two stories compiled into one, then yeah, Adam and Eve were the only two people alive at the time. Cain married his sister and was afraid of all the city people who must all have been his brothers and sisters because I guess Eve just never stopped having kids and she must have had quintuplets every time or something. That surely makes a lot more sense than the idea that these were just ancient creation myths and are not literally true. The evolutionary model claims they lived around 100,000 to 200,000 years ago and belonged to a hominin population of 10,000 individuals. Well, in my reading through of the studies, both the ones that you cited and the ones I had to find myself, I didn't see any hard population numbers. But it would have been more than two, certainly. But as you will see, it's not the genetic data that conflicts with the biblical account of Adam and Eve. The conflict comes from inferences about time and population size. Well, I mean, if you're not taking issue with the data itself, just the time and population size, then you must be okay with the idea of anti-Adam being our Y-chromosome common ancestor with Neanderthals who lived before Biblical Adam. Because that's what the genetic data shows, even if we ignore the precise dating. Evolutionary geneticists estimate that genetic Adam and Eve lived around 100,000 to 200,000 years ago, using a method known as the molecular clock. Yes, molecular clock dating. A dating method that definitely has some unresolved issues and is not the most reliable of our dating methods. Importantly though, for a lot of the molecular clock dating methods to work at all, they have to be calibrated with known species divergence points. So to use molecular clock dating on human DNA, we need to first know when the human chimp common ancestor existed in order to calibrate the clock. To borrow an analogy, trying to date something with the molecular clock but without a known divergence point would be like trying to calculate the speed of a car by just looking at the odometer. It's simply not possible. But if you know the distance of the trip and how long it took to travel that distance, then you can calculate the average speed. And while there are plenty of issues with molecular clock dating that are much more glaring than the typical issues that creationists are normally perfectly happy to pick at, I'm guessing that they are going to try to not poke too many holes in the dating method itself because of those couple of papers from the 90s that, if taken at face value, would place mitochondrial Eve as having lived about 6,000 years ago. And creationists love how well that matches with their story, so rather than go into detail about all the problems with molecular clock dating, they tend to focus on the mutation rate of mitochondrial DNA, claiming that it's much faster than the rate that is used to place mitochondrial Eve at 99 to 148,000 years, all the while ignoring everything else to do with molecular clock dating because it really doesn't support their narrative. 
The technique relies on the assumption that mutations accumulate in certain regions of the genome at a constant rate over deep time. Sometimes yes, but as with other dating methods, there are different variations on a similar theme. Other times, molecular clock dating relies on counting how many times a specific gene has undergone recombination. And again, as with other dating methods, these different approaches have different uses and are applicable in different scenarios. Evolutionary scientists have to further assume that humans evolved from a chimp-like ancestor roughly six million years ago in order to calibrate the molecular clock. Okay, maybe these guys are taking a slightly different path than normal. Most creationists don't mention that the time of our divergence from the chimp lineage is a key to performing these calculations. Spoiler though, they don't take long at all to start fixating on mitochondrial mutation rates as though those are the be-all and end-all for all molecular clock dating methods, which they are not. Both claims are problematic and have been called into question by the genetics community. Okay, so I know that the mutation rate definitely has some issues, particularly with the mitochondrial DNA. We actually know that the mutation rate changes depending on whether we're measuring over short or long periods of time, and we haven't quite figured out why that is yet, or at what point it is appropriate to switch from the short period rate to the long period rate when performing these calculations. The most likely reason for this difference, well, it's most likely a combination of factors, but the easiest to understand is to consider how evolution works. Different forces put selection pressures on a population, such that certain variations are selected for and others are selected against. So if there's a wide range of variability over the short term, it's somewhat expected for that range to decrease over the long term, which gives the appearance of a different mutation rate depending on which time scales you're measuring, when in reality the mutation rate is likely the same, but the fixation of these mutations in a population takes longer than the mutation by itself, and so over long periods the rate appears slower as we are likely only measuring mutations that did become fixed, because the fixed ones are the only ones we'll even be able to compare to modern DNA. If it didn't become fixed, there would be no modern analog. And of course, this solution isn't perfect. We, Like I said, we still don't understand what's going on here. And this, for instance, doesn't explain why this problem doesn't appear to show up in the Y chromosome, it's only in the mitochondria, but it is one of the proposed solutions. Distinguished evolutionary geneticist David Reich of Harvard confessed in the publication in Nature, the fact that the clock is so uncertain is very problematic for us. It means that the dates we get out of genetics are really quite embarrassingly bad and uncertain. Yes, that's one of the reasons why the ranges given for these mitochondrial and Y chromosome ancestors are so large, because of this uncertainty. There's also the question of generation time. How many years pass between an individual being born and that individual having kids of their own? This is not necessarily a constant rate, and especially when we go back to animals that we know only from fossils, we really have no way of knowing for sure what the generation time was. Certainly we can make educated guesses, but there's no way of really knowing for sure. Scientists are now using a more straightforward approach to determine mutation rates that do not require ape-to-man evolutionary assumptions. That's not quite accurate. There have always been two methods, the pedigree method and the phylogenetic method. The pedigree method is the one where they are measuring the differences between people who are known to be descended from each other, while the phylogenetic method is the one that relies on data from common ancestry. But notably, the study that looked at the pedigree method for the Y chromosome, which your video is referencing right now, found that their mutation rate lined up with the mutation rates that were determined through the phylogenetic method, while the mitochondrial DNA study was essentially pointing out the well-known fact that mitochondrial DNA seems to mutate at different rates depending on the time scale, and that the reason for this is not known at this point. And so this paper is advocating for caution when using mitochondrial DNA as a molecular clock. It involves directly measuring mutation rates in the present, comparing parents and offspring known as the pedigree method. Well, they're comparing the living descendants of deceased relatives to the deceased relatives who sometimes lived a few hundred years ago, so maybe not as deep into the past as the phylogenetic method goes, but it still goes into the past. When comparing DNA sequences between parents and children, the measured mutation rates are typically 10 to 20 times higher than those inferred based on assumptions of ape-to-man evolution. Okay, that's not even close to accurate. There was one study in the 90s that found a mutation rate that was 20 times higher than that obtained with the phylogenetic method, and no study since then has found such a high rate, except at the very extreme ends of their estimates, with most of the pedigree studies showing rates that are 7 to 10 times slower than the Parsons study from 1997. 
Also, remember, these higher mutation rates are exclusively from the mitochondrial studies. The Y-chromosome studies match up closely with the expected results based on the phylogenetic models. So we have four variations on methodology here, two each for the Y-chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA. Three out of four of these variations line up perfectly, and you are using this to say that the fourth one that is the outlier must actually be the correct one? The more likely scenario here is that something is going on in the mitochondria that we do not yet understand that makes their short-term mutation rates much faster than their long-term rates, or at least appear much faster. And as we don't know exactly what it is that's causing this, we are at this time unable to account for it. When the molecular clock is calibrated using the empirically measured mutation rates, both mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam lived just thousands of years ago. Not according to any of the sources you have listed. Well, I mean, I guess that depends on some quirks of language. Technically, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands could also be referred to as thousands, but the youngest actual estimate I could find from your sources comes from a paper that was cited by a paper that you cited that placed the Y chromosome common ancestor at roughly 44,000 years ago. So much younger than the modern estimate of two to 300,000 years ago that was based on new data that was not available when this paper was published. But even if we ignore the new data, that's still seven times older than the universe is supposed to be. Also, bit of a side note, I like how you guys latch on to the fact that these common ancestors are described using biblical terms and claim that that must mean that these discoveries align with the biblical story instead of just being slightly analogous to a culturally ubiquitous story. But for some reason, I've never heard a creationist mention what is being pointed out in this study here, that this younger Y-chromosome common ancestor supported the weak Garden of Eden hypothesis. Perhaps because that hypothesis is more obviously not perfectly analogous to the Garden of Eden story? For context, that hypothesis was the idea that human populations separated about 100,000 years ago, but didn't really start expanding or migrating much until after the last glaciation period. I can definitely see the analog, and if anything it fits better than the Adam and Eve story does with our Y chromosome and mitochondrial last common ancestor, but it too obviously requires the Earth to be older than 6,000 years old, so we can't have that. So not only do creationists cherry-pick the data that they like, they even cherry-pick the biblical analogies of the data, ignoring the ones that aren't quite close enough for their liking. In discussing the age of mitochondrial Eve, evolutionary scientists in trends in genetics acknowledge this discrepancy. MTDNA datasets often exhibit anomalous patterns. One of these anomalies is the discrepancy between MTDNA mutation rates observed in evolutionary timescales for example, in dating the divergence between two species and those measured within family pedigrees. Yes, that is the aforementioned different mutation rate depending on the scale on which it is measured. If the high mutation rates seen in some human pedigrees were used to calculate the age of our most recent female common ancestor, she would have lived just 6,000 years ago, a date more consistent with biblical Eve than mitochondrial Eve. There's a few things here. First, this seems to be their way of citing that very commonly cited article in creationist circles that talks about mitochondrial Eve being a mere 6,000 years old without actually directly citing that article, making the citation more subtle. Instead of directly citing that article, which is well known among those who are familiar with creationist arguments and how to respond to them, they cite a paper that cites that article. In that article, they did say that Eve would have existed 6,000 years ago using data from the 1997 Parsons study. You remember that one? The only one that was very anomalous in its results with every other study showing a rate that was seven to ten times slower than it? Yeah, that one. So if we push it back seven to ten times older than the Parsons study suggests, we get a range of between 42,000 to 60,000 years. But more to the point, the study that is being referenced here was actually suggesting that the reason our estimates are so far off is because mitochondrial DNA might not be as exclusive to the female line as previously thought. It is possible that it does undergo recombination with the paternal mitochondrial DNA, which could account for these discrepancies. That said, all the research into mitochondrial DNA recombination seems to be about two decades old, with the consensus today seeming to still be that recombination does not affect mitochondrial DNA. So that is not likely to be a solution to this problem. But again, to reiterate, the only study that found a mutation rate that would place mitochondrial Eve in the vicinity of a young Earth creationist Eve is now a quarter of a century old, with 
all of the more recent studies finding slower mutation rates. So us not having solved the problem of mitochondrial DNA mutating faster over the short term than the long term is not in any way a win for creationism. And in the interest of full disclosure, I did find a preprint paper from 2018 that does seem to be attempting to resurrect the idea of mitochondrial recombination, but as a preprint, it has not yet been subject to peer review, and while I am certainly not qualified to be a peer reviewer for any genetics paper, I also can't find any evidence of this paper actually having been published any time in the past four years, which leads me to believe that it did not make it through the peer review process. There's a long-standing debate, and argument in genetics. And that deals with the difference between what's called the phylogenetic mutation rate and the genealogical mutation rate. Specifically for mitochondrial DNA, this debate is not applicable anywhere else to the best of my knowledge. If you look at a family, you can count the differences between the people and you say, oh, they've had some mutations. And you can actually calculate a mutation rate over time in today's time, in known time, right now, we know what the mutation rate is. But the evolutionary community doesn't like to use that rate because it's too fast. Yes, of course, the evolutionary community doesn't like it, so they ignore it. It's too fast. That's why there are literally dozens of studies on that exact thing. No, it's more that we don't like to use that rate specifically for molecular clock dating because it's the odd one out. Both methods of determining mutation rate agree on the Y chromosome and give us old ages. Using recombination as a molecular clock also gives us old ages. Using the phylogenetic method with mitochondrial DNA gives us ages that match up with both methods for the Y chromosome and the recombination method. So the one place where the numbers don't match is when we use the pedigree method specifically on mitochondrial DNA. Since using the pedigree method on mitochondrial DNA gives us results that don't agree with all the other methods, which are all in pretty close agreement with each other, it stands to reason that there's something else going on with mitochondrial DNA that we don't yet understand, and so using the pedigree method for obtaining dates is not recommended at this time. Creationists just discard all this and decide that the one that looks like it might fit with the Bible if you squint hard enough must be the right method and all the other ones are wrong. And of course, let's not forget that this whole thing is a bit of a bait and switch, where they're clearly presenting this in a way that's intended to make you think that the same problem happens on the Y chromosome, which is not the case. And that's where I'll leave it for today. This guy just essentially repeats everything we just heard, almost verbatim, so I'm not going to cover the rest of his spiel. Also, remember how last time they were referring to Dr. Jeanson as a geneticist when a more appropriate title would have been developmental biologist? Well, this Dr. Robert Carter guy is also being labeled as a geneticist, while his PhD is in marine biology. Now, certainly geneticist might be an appropriate title depending on what exactly they specialized in to get their respective degrees, but the fact that anyone with an advanced degree in any biology-related field is getting labeled as a geneticist in this video seems kind of fishy to me. Today's comment of the day comes to us from, well, basically all of you. In last week's video, the guy commented that he used to be a pagan, long-haired hippie, and followed that line up with, I guess God has a sense of humor. I somehow missed that the joke that he was going for was that when he was a pagan, he had lots of hair, but when he decided to follow the one true God, that God cursed him with baldness. Which seems like an odd thing for an apologist to be pointing out. I think I probably missed it because at this point in my life I'm just too far removed from when I had the mindset that God is responsible for everything, and so I didn't make the connection between him being bald and God causing him to have gone bald. Or maybe I can just be incredibly thick at times. Thanks for watching, special thanks to this week's PayPal heroes, Charles, Ryan, Deborah, and Oliver, and special thanks as always to my patrons, iOS Tilt Bill Gamer, Bryn Pound, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, and all the rest, who are the mitochondrial DNA that resists the recombination that is my channel. If you'd like to move fast or slow, depending on how you're being measured, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, links to social media, all the ways to support the channel and to my other projects can be found at links.vicerhino.com. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!
when we last left off, when we last left off, left off, last left off, last left off, last left off. That's surprisingly hard to say.